I invite you to take a seat and to take your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to the book of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, is our text. And, uh, and we invite you to join us and follow along. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1025. That's 1025. You'll be able to uh, uh, follow along in the text with us. And as always, if you're here in the room and you want a Bible, you don't have one, you don't have one that you can understand, uh, you don't have one that has large print, whatever it is, if you want a Bible that you can read, uh, then take one of those. Uh, it's our gift to you. We only ask that you read it. Because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, let us know. Message our service host. Uh, email us at the church office. We'll be glad to get you a Bible one way or another. Hey, I don't know if you really pay attention or if you come regularly enough, but every week we mention Calvary's core value of relatable truth. Uh, we believe relatable truth is if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. You just heard me say that. And we begin almost every service with some form of that challenge, some form of that encouragement, because we know that it will happen. If you read God's Word and if you apply God's Word to your life, God will change you. I mean, you can't stay the same in that context. And it's so simple an idea to grasp. Everyone in this room, everyone watching understands that reality, but it is, it's a challenge to live. So our desire here at Calvary is to lead everyone to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's why it's our mission statement. That's why we tattooed it on our wall out there. Uh, we want everyone to know that. We want you to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And, and that happens when you surrender to Jesus, when you confess Him as Savior and Lord, when you say, I need you to save me from my sins and, and make me yours. And, and if you've never done that, we want you to do it right now. We want you just to, to go ahead and, and say, Jesus, I need you, and you're, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, you were raised from the dead, and I commit myself to following you, and he'll change your life. Now, if you've already done that, you know that you are forgiven by God of all your sins. But that's not the last time that you surrender. We surrender when we obey. When we do things like baptism, where we say, okay, Jesus is my Lord, so I'm going to tell the world that I am an unashamed follower of Jesus, and, and you declare your faith in baptism. Why baptism? Because Jesus asked us to. To do that is our first sign of obedience as his children. And then it happens as you learn and apply God's word, that's called growing. If you like fancy church words, it's called sanctification. Okay, for those of you that are purists. Every now and then, you got to throw one in just so you guys will go, okay, he knows the words. Um, so anyway, it, you know, but if you learn and apply God's Word, then God's going to change your life. You're going to grow up in Christ. You're going to mature. And see, here's the reality. And this is why we preach this. This is why we teach this. This is why we encourage this. This is why we beg you to read and apply God's Word, because following Jesus improves your life in every single way. I mean, first of all, it improves your life for all eternity because instead of getting hell, which is what we deserve, you get to go to heaven. I mean, that alone makes it worth following Jesus, okay? Can I just tell you that? If you're like, I need a good reason, there's a reason. But if you need more, following Jesus also improves your relationships, yeah, it, it helps you to love better. Why? Because the great command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if you will apply that in a serious way, if you'll believe God at his word and live in love, it'll change every relationship that you have. By the way, if you missed last week's sermon on radical love, you might want to go back and watch it online. Uh, you can do that at calvaryaz.com and just pull it up and partake of the message or the whole service. And then, of course, following Jesus improves your life. Every facet of your life because we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. That's what we're looking at tonight. Just two short verses. Jesus says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. 
Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. We reap what we sow. Now, there's a fancy word to describe this principle of reaping what you sow. It's called reciprocity. If you want to impress your friends, write it down. Reciprocity. If you don't know how to spell it, yeah, Google can help you, okay? But, but here's the thing. It's reciprocity that tells us that we're going to reap what we sow. It is not what is commonly known and referred to as karma. I know, you guys use that word. Everybody does. There's a lot of great memes that you can put on there about karma. But it, it just reveals, I hate to put this way, that reveals our ignorance. Karma doesn't mean what you think it does. Karma is a, is a concept from Hinduism and Buddhism, which means that what you do in this life will impact how you live your next life. Um, just for the record, if you're a follower of Jesus, we don't believe in reincarnation. Okay? It's appointed in a man once to die and then judgment. You don't get a second chance at messing this life up. Okay? You only get one chance, and that's why it's so important for you to know Jesus. Uh, but don't refer to, you know, what goes around, comes around as karma. It's reciprocity. It means that you reap what you sow. And this idea of reciprocity is woven throughout scriptures. I mean, from beginning to end, you're going to find it there. Now, the, the clearest statement of all is found by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6 when he says, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. In other words, you're not getting away with anything. He says, whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he will from the flesh reap destruction. If he sows to the Spirit, he will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You're going to reap what you sow. You can't get away from it. Now, this is cause and effect. This is consequences of your choices. This is the results of your actions. It's a biblical principle that is inescapable. Now, since the listeners were familiar with farming, reap what you sow was a very simple concept. So if you plant corn, what are you going to get? You guys are brilliant, except for one person over here. Hey, it's my job to be funny anyway. If you plant wheat, what are you going to get? Wheat. Yeah. See, it's not right. If you plant, plant flowers, what are you going to get? Flowers. Okay, so if you plant weeds, what are you going to get? Weeds. Yeah. You're going to reap what you sow. Yeah. It, it, it's unavoidable. We're, we reap what we sow. And Jesus specifically addresses three areas of life. In this little passage that we just read, Jesus addresses three areas of life that that if we want blessings in our life, we need to listen and we need to apply. So I want to challenge you to listen and apply because if we read God's word and we apply God's word, God will change our lives. The first one is words create worlds. I wish that was original with me, but I borrowed it uh, from uh, a guy who was actually working with our, our team and I loved it. The words we use create the worlds we live in. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Uh, isn't that amazing? Just the thought of that. So which kind of world would you rather live in? Option A, a world that is full of encouragement, affirmation, hopeful, joyful, and trusting. Or option B, a world of critique and condemnation that is full of slander, anger, and judgment. Who wants option A? Okay, who's sick and wants option B? <laughs> it's a sucker question. We all say we want option A. But here's the thing. Your words create the world you live in. And right away, we want to protest. We want to argue. No, well, the, the people in my life, they're just negative, and they're critical, and they're condemning, and you don't know. The people in my life, they're just, they're just nasty. No, I'm not talking about the people in your life. I'm not talking about their words. I'm talking about your words. This is about you will reap what you sow. They'll have to live with their own consequences of their choices, but this is about you. So what kind of world are your words creating? 
Option A or option B. Now see, the Bible is full of admonitions about how we speak. Proverbs chapter 12, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Are, are, are your words, you know, ripping people to shreds or are they healing their lives? In Ephesians 4, the apostle Paul said, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Only that which is beneficial to those who hear that it may build up those who listen. So are your words unwholesome or are they helpful? And, th and then Romans chapter 12, Paul says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Are your words blessing or are they cursing? Or how about Jesus? In Matthew chapter 12, if you want to flip there, you can. It's page 971. He says this. <laughs> He's talking to religious leaders, so it applies to us. You brood of vipers, <laughs> bunch of snakes. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Wow. That's kind of scary. Don't hear that a whole lot, do you? Jesus is challenging us that our words create worlds. What kind of world do you want to live in? So your words are so powerful. You might think you're weak. You might think you're insignificant. You might think you don't have influence, but your words are powerful. And every time you open your mouth, you're going to bless or you're going to curse. You're going to build up or you're going to tear down. You're going to wound or you're going to heal. So um, if you bless others, what are you going to reap? <laughs> you guys seemed really uncertain. You know, there's like six people that are like, yeah, blessings? Is that, is that right? No, seriously, if you, if you, look, if you bless people, what kind of results are you going to reap? Yeah, you're going to reap blessings back. If you curse people, what kind of world are you going to live in? It's going to be full of? Yeah, curses. Do you, do you realize that, that we reap what we sow by how we speak to other people? You are going to reap what you sow by how you speak to other people. This is so easy to grasp, but it's so hard to do. But, but we need to get a hold of this and change the way that we talk. Uh, parents, if you've got kids in your house, there's no place more powerfully uh, exhibited than this. And... and, and uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person in this room that carries the scars of inadvertent words in childhood. So let me, let me just tell you my story. I was raised by workaholic parents. They loved Jesus. I was always in church. I knew I was loved. They, you know, we had enough, all that good stuff. But, but they were workaholics, and, and they loved to work. I, pray for them, because they, they still are just, you know, that was just, until the day they died, they, they wanted to work. And, and here's the thing. I don't mind work, but I like to play. I mean, I like to play. I like to make work fun, okay? That's what I like to do. So I could turn the chores into a game and then get in trouble for it. And so the moniker that I got labeled with as a child, guess what? My mom and my dad both called me lazy. I was the lazy son. Why? Because I like to have fun. I could goof off better than any of my brothers. And... Uh, and still can. But, but here's the thing. That followed me into adulthood. And here I am, the pastor of Calvary. Calvary's a little church. And the first 10 years, I could hardly take a day off if I was in town. You know why? Because no matter how much the church was growing, no matter how good things were happening, no matter how many lives were being changed, every time I took time off, there was an accusation in my head that said, you're lazy. And I almost burned out trying to defeat the curse that had been placed on me by parents who loved me. Our words matter. Our words create worlds that we're living in. So parents, encourage and bless your children. Speak with kindness to each other. Spouses, 
Come on. We can encourage, we can bless. Repent of the gossip and the slander and the accusations and the innuendos that you make. It will bless your life because you reap what you sow. Yeah. So words create worlds, and Jesus not only addresses our words, he addresses our mercy because forgiven people forgive. Forgiven people forgive. Uh, just continue on, verse 38, forgive and you will be forgiven. Now, if you just take that at, at just simple face value, it seems like it's saying, hey, if you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive. Uh, there's similar passages in the Gospel of Matthew, and, uh, but at the same time, we know that when you follow Jesus, all of your sins are forgiven. So statements like that kind of freak people out. So let me try to explain this. Um, forgiven people forgive. See, we are followers of Jesus. If we're followers of Jesus, if we believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, if we believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, and he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, you're forgiven, right? You know that you are forgiven of all your sins, okay? Do you guys know that? Okay, you're forgiven of all your sins, so because we're forgiven, what do we naturally do? We forgive. If you don't know that you're forgiven, you don't forgive. Not easily, not comfortably. And see, this is a life issue because it's about do you understand, do you know, do you recognize that Jesus has forgiven you? And again, it, it, it fits with the whole reciprocity. Jesus in Matthew uh, chapter 5 said, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. Yeah, see, there's that reciprocity again. If you're merciful, you get mercy. It flows into your life. So, two thoughts on us being people who forgive, living a grace-filled life, okay? And it's, this is for you if you're struggling to forgive, okay? You know who you are. If you're harboring anger, resentment, uh, you know, there's somebody that you just still get all clench your fist when you hear their name, uh, you're, you're angry about stuff. If, if you're unforgiving or struggling to forgive, just hear these two things. First of all, Jesus forgave you more than he asked you to forgive others. Okay, Jesus forgave you more, right? Because Jesus didn't offend you. He didn't harm you. He didn't insult you. He didn't betray you. And yet, we did all that to him. We rebelled, we defied, we blasphemed, we disobeyed, we betrayed Jesus, and yet Jesus still died for our sins. He died for all my sins. He died for all your sins. Period. See, that's mercy. Because you've been forgiven simply by asking God to forgive you. Right? You show up, you say, Jesus, will you forgive me? Yeah, Scripture says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins. And guess what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All of it. So you're forgiven far more than anyone would ever need forgiveness from you. So you're forgiven, so forgive. Second thing, if you're struggling with this, understand that forgiveness is a blessing for your life. Forgiveness is for you. Jesus doesn't ask you to forgive other people so that, you know, you'll just be a suffering servant and forgive even though you shouldn't forgive. He asks you to forgive because he wants you to be blessed. You say, how so? Well, I've heard it said that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping somebody else dies. Yeah, that's not going to work so good, is it? I've heard it said that unforgiveness is allowing someone else to live rent-free in your head. You're not hurting them by holding on to that grudge. You're not hurting them by holding on to that anger and that bitterness. You're just hurting yourself. And so Jesus commands forgiveness because he wants to bless us. And so when we delight in God's grace towards us, when we forgive others who have wronged us, when we let go of the anger and the bitterness and the rage and the desire for revenge, we are healed and we are blessed. Right, because if you live a life of grace and mercy, what do you reap? 
Yeah, grace and mercy. If you live a life of bitterness and anger, what do you get? God, see, doesn't it make so much sense when you look at it in this context of reciprocity, but you're going to reap what you sow? So if you want anger and bitterness in your life, just stay mad at everybody. See how that's going to work out for you. First of all, you won't have a lot of friends. You'll never have to treat anyone for lunch. And so uh, that'll be good. But then you'll probably die alone. And uh, that's not really cool. See, grace and mercy. Forgiven people forgive. Because we want to live in those blessings of mercy because we reap what we sow. Yeah. And, and then the third area of life that Jesus addresses is that grateful people are generous. Verse 38, he continues, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, we put into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, since none of us are like really trading in, uh, you know, baskets of wheat or barley or any other kind of agricultural thing, just ignore that middle pressed down, shaken together, running over, poured in your lap thing. I don't want all that stuff poured in my lap anyway. I don't think you do either. But hear this, given it will be given to you for the measure you use will be measured back to you. That's reciprocity. See, God not only wants to bless your family through words and not only wants to bless you through mercy, God wants to bless your life through generosity. And he tells you that. You see, when you realize the blessings that God has poured out, I mean blessings like love and forgiveness, eternal life, as well as all the material blessings that you have. You know, the food you eat, the shelter you have, the clothing you wear, the transportation that you have, the disposable income that we have. The fact that we're living in a place of peace right now. See, all of those physical blessings, you, you, when you realize that, you're overwhelmed with gratitude. Let me say that again. When you realize how blessed you are, you are overwhelmed with gratitude. It is easy for you to praise God. It is easy for you to give thanks because you understand how much God has given you. And when you realize that, you want to share. You want to bless others. You want to help. You want to be generous. And when you realize that, you realize that God delights in generosity and you reap what you sow. Again, the Apostle Paul writing to the uh, Corinthian church about an offering that he was collecting. So the Jerusalem church was persecuted and they, were, they, they couldn't work. They lost their jobs. Lost all their, so the Apostle Paul, as he's traveling around all the churches that he started, he said, I'm going to take up an offering for the Jerusalem church. And, and he let them know, hey, I'm coming and I, I'm going to get there. Don't embarrass me. See, the Corinthian church had a lot of money. And he was like, don't embarrass me by being cheapskates. Don't embarrass me by making this seem really burdensome. Go ahead and collect the offering. And he said this, 2 Corinthians 9, he said, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap. Hey, you guys read this. And whoever sows generously will also reap. Yeah. Now, I want you to understand, that's in the context of taking up an offering. There's no escaping that. Paul's saying, look, I, I want you to go ahead and do this because I want you to be blessed because if you're a cheapskate, you're not going to get anything. And if you're generous, God's going to bless you. You're going to reap generously. So um, it sort of looks like this. Imagine that God physically tells you, hey, I want to I pour out blessings in your life, so hold your hands out. And you go, yeah, fill them up, God. I wish I had bigger hands, Okay. And God fills our hands up with blessings. And we're like, oh, that is so cool. I like this stuff. I think I'm going to keep it. Now you've got the blessings that God gave you and you're hanging on to them. And you're like, God, I want some more blessings. <laughs> God's like, well, open up your hands. Well, I can't open up my hands. I'm holding on to the blessings that you gave me. God's like, that's the problem. You can't get more when you're holding on to what you have. And so when you let it go, when you give it away, when you share it, you open up your hands, and what are you able to do? You're able to receive more. I mean, it's that simple. 
It, it is really that simple. Are you living your life with open hands? Are you living your life with closed fists, holding on to the blessings that God has given you, and you're missing out on the blessings that he wants to give you? Do you have open hands toward God? Are you giving to church, to ministry, to kingdom causes? By the way, I applaud and appreciate the faithful generosity of Calvary as a church. I mean, as a church, you guys are generous and it's beautiful and I appreciate that. But this isn't, I'm not talking to the church as a whole. I'm talking to individuals here. If you want to be blessed, are you being generous toward God? See, he actually talks in Scripture about a tithe, and a tithe is 10% of your income, and the reason that God asks for 10% is not because he needs anything, but he wants us to trust him. And you reap what you sow. Are you being generous towards uh, the needy? Do you have open hands towards the needy? And by that, I'm talking about like children of compassion. You know, we sponsor compassion centers in Honduras. We sponsor kids. We're going to have a compassion Sunday, compassion weekend in a couple of months, uh, end of April. Uh, and, and so, you know, are you, are you being, you know, generous towards children of compassion? Are you being generous towards benevolence? You know, we take up a benevolence offering when we observe communion, and, and uh, I just had someone catch me and say, hey, I ran into somebody, and they were bragging on Calvary for how we helped them out. I hadn't heard the story. But see, you, are, are you being generous towards others? Are you being generous towards the food bank or doing gift bags at Christmas? Do you have open hands toward your neighbors? By your neighbors, I mean like the servers at the restaurants. You know, tip for Jesus, not for service. Your, your, you know, your reputation, your witness is way more important than making a point. Jesus' reputation is worth a whole lot more than you being cheap. So are you generous for your service? Are you generous toward the charities that are in town, the local charities? I mean, as a church, we support a bunch of them, but are, are you being generous for them? By, by the way, great job on bringing back the, the bottles with the money in them for pregnancy care, but there's more bottles out there. Let's fill them up and get it, bring them in. Hey, are you being generous toward the Girl Scouts? Because they're selling cookies right now. <laughs> it's cookie season. And some of you are like me. You're like, I can't eat the cookies and wear my pants, okay? So, so that's okay. You can still be generous. You know what would be a cool idea? I'm going to throw this out there. Let's see what, see what happens. What about if a life group goes and buys up a bunch of cookies and like takes them to the f police station or the fire station and just gives them to all the employees? What do you think about that? Or what about if uh, you go up there, you can do this. I found out this because I've done this last couple of years. You go in and buy a whole bunch of cookies and send them to troops because they'll do that for you. Isn't that cool? See, it's just it's that idea of, of having open hands toward your neighbors. See, God desires us to live joyfully generous lives because we reap what we sow. See, you can't escape this biblical principle. It's present in our words. It's present in our forgiveness. It's present in our generosity. We're going to reap what we sow. And my prayer for you is that you will choose to sow to the Spirit. Because from the Spirit, you will reap life and peace. Let's pray. Father, your word is true, and it pierces our hearts. There's nothing we can hide from you, so you know our words. And, and today we repent. Lord, you know our mercy, our lack of it, and we repent. God, you know our generosity or our resistance to it, and we repent because your word promises that you're gonna bless us if we will believe you, if we will apply it to our lives. And God, you've already told us we're gonna reap what we sow. We wanna sow to the Spirit. We wanna live like Jesus teaches us because we're followers of Jesus and because we wanna live in your blessings. So my prayer is that your Holy Spirit would move in this room, that you would meet us at our point of disobedience and you would bring conviction so that we can change God, I pray you'd meet us at our point of weakness and you would give us strength so that we can change. God, I pray that you'd meet us at our point of obedience and you would challenge us to trust you even more so that we could be changed. And God, I thank you that you love us even as we are, even as you call us to walk in your blessings. 
So my ultimate prayer is that we would hear your word and we would apply it to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.